even fancier paintings by incognito mode. Now we did see the I am become fancy video on inner historians main channel. And to see this paired up with another incognito mode upload, I do love me some incognito mode. Take that as you will. Alas, let's get into it. NordVPN isn't like the other girls. Oh my god. <laughs> Hello, incognito mode videos now. Oh. Right, so the schedule for this mini series goes like this. Ooh. We did the main channel on theater, then an incognito mode on painting, which is this. Then there's a right. main channel on wine, and then an incognito mode on a bunch of stories around wine. Man, that's going to be a wild pair. There's a main channel on things that people wear. There's a main channel on luxury goods, and yeah. then we round the whole thing off with two more incognito modes. And then I go back into cryostasis. This That's actually a lot for an art historian. That's a lot. I, for one, welcome this. First section is on the basics of painting, and we were a little bit worried to show it because we, we kind of felt like this will split the audience. Oh. Not because it's political or anything, but because <laughs> it's so basic. <laughs> it's like you know it's gonna be good when it's gonna be controversial <laughs> it's okay it's 2023 on youtube like every other day we have just a large creator having something going on some form of controversy happens someone's done something i i like that this is uh <laughs> I'm going to use manufactured quote unquote controversy because if it splits an audience down the middle, but it's like super funny or super positive, I'm for it. it, it this is great. So someone nice who already knows face. something about art would be like, yeah, of course. Why are you telling me this? But for someone like me, who knows practically zero about art, I found it really interesting. And I thought, why the heck haven't I been told this before, right? No, no joke. Like I was actually, uh, unironically, actually, uh, the night before I was uh, watching this, right? Um, <laughs> I was listening to someone break down the music theory of My Chemical Romance's Welcome to the Black Parade and how certain things worked. One, th I think it was like one, uh, one, four, five. Uh, versus a one three six. Someone's gonna know exactly what I'm talking about in regards to music theory. And I'm just like, man, there's a reason I left music theory. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Someone who studied music theory would be like, oh yeah, no, Kip, that's exactly what's going on here. It's just a rock opera. These are the things that play here. Versus me, who's literally a dingus. Like ah, now nah, this is pretty cool. I like this. I it, sa same vibe. So, first section. All right, quiet on the set. Basics of painting. Action! The arts. The arts. <laughs> Do not put an F in front of that worst mistake I ever made in my life. Oh no. <laughs> All right, first, some things that'll make you go, yeah, and? Uh huh. Or, oh, right. So look at this colorful goo. Paint. 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 Delicious in both the jam. Great, great to eat. Um, and <laughs> chip form. But its raw components are just two essential things. Oil an dye? undissolving pigment and a medium. Yeah, Now, makes pigments sense. are basically just colorful dust. Yeah. And the medium is the liquidy thing that the dust hangs out in. Yeah. Now, the liquid determines what type of paint you have. Right. Pigment plus... Oil-based, water-based paints, I'm assuming he's going to dive into. Water equals watercolors. Right. Pigment plus glue equals acrylics. Huh. Pigment plus oil yeah. equals oil paints. So it's blowing my mind, actually. Like, this is like an episode of, like, how it's made. Just blows my mind. So simple. And pigment plus, moving on. Now, the pigment does not dissolve into the medium. Instead, it's just kind of suspended in it. Right. When the pigment does dissolve into a medium, that's a dye. Uh -huh. So that's the basic difference. Oh. Now, you have to try that makes a lot of sense, actually. That actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. Transfer the paint onto the canvas. To do that, we need to talk tools. Well, I'm actually surprised that this wasn't a power drill. The amount of times on TikTok and YouTube I've seen people just resort to power drills actually causes me emotional damage. First, you can just use your fingers. Yeah. It was good enough for the cavemen, and it's good enough for your mom. <laughs> so it's good enough for us. Then we tried brushes. Yeah. Now, here is the anatomy of a brush. Yeah. You've got the handle, the bristles, the ferrule, and the crimp. Right. Now, the okay. bristles are the most important bit. 
First, we were just using mangled up reeds called fronds. Uh huh. But they got really good once we started. I, I heard that friends reference. I did using animal hair. Yeah. Have a look at some of the animals we used. Boar. <laughs> taken. Yeah, horse horse hair. I think is still used a lot, isn't it? From the neck or the back of the pig. That is the kind of brush that Van Gogh used, and it's still <laughs> the gold standard for today. A goat brush. It's good, but it's not the goat. Lacks some spring. It's not the goat. Oh my god, did he actually just say that? That was actually great. So it's mostly used for calligraphy. Badger. Yeah. Now that's actually mostly used for shaving, not painting at all. Yeah. Horse, raccoon, Horse. and wolf. Also <laughs> not great quality. But what's the worst quality of all? I'm assuming we have synthetic strands as well, actually. I'm assuming we do. It doesn't have to be horsehair, pig hair, etc. I'm assuming we have actual synthetic strains and start strands excuse me you know the gutter oil of the brush world uh -huh. well the worst quality is camel hair brushes really and they're mostly sold as arts and crafts brushes for kids yeah i can but see the that the weird thing is camel hair is so low quality that it's not even used in brushes at all uh huh yes so-called camel camel cigarettes <laughs> There's so this video is just so thick. It is so much. Hair brushes are actually made from cats and rabbits and squirrels. <laughs> but that makes people kind of sad. So they changed the name to a much less cute animal and also one that's kind of exotic, so you wouldn't question it. Now, yeah. what's the best yeah. brush of all? What is the S tier of brushes? Those are made from sable. Oh my god, this. What? Of course, 10 out of 10. Now, sable is a type of weasel. These are hunted. Of course, it's a weasel. It's always weasels. No, I'm not going to extrapolate. It's always weasels, though. Well, they're fur for clothing. <laughs> yeah. It's him. <laughs> but when they catch them to make clothes, they actually only want the body for the clothes. And so they discard the tail altogether. Interesting. But those tails have the best hair for paint brushes. Interesting. And so they are snatched up by the brush makers. Now the hair is special because it has an interlocking scales that huh. vastly increases the surface area. Really? But it also holds strong in the long term. Firm and bouncy, but also soft. It's smooth. That's very interesting, actually. Like, I'm, I'm loving this. Smooth. It bounces. It moves. Only with new Tresemme Keratin Smooth. <laughs> and they sell for upwards of $300 a brush. Yikes. I mean, you, I guess you pay for quality, right? Wow. End of part. <laughs> oh, is this the ad read? Off the sound, this is the ad read. All right, here's a top 10 list, sort of maybe watch mojo style of the most famous paintings and just a few interesting things about them that you may not know. Pop quiz, sports shoe wearer. Look at this sports painting. Shoe. What does it make you feel? Uh, envy and anger, the greens and reds, I would assume. Eh. Too late. Or if you answered in time, wrong answer. Eh, Happy, fair. sad. I bet those are the only two emotions you even know. What? The correct answer is shame, because you are embarrassing yourself. You. I could, if he's not, if he's not memeing, I could actually see that though. Know nothing about the arts. So it is time to look at the best paintings to ever <laughs> exist. And let's begin with the most obscure of them all. Whoever this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I don't like that. Ah, uh, the Mona Lisa. Now, I thought it went first name Mona, last name Lisa. Check it out. But it turns no? out Mona is an honorific, meaning madam. So it's Madam Lisa. That makes sense. Now, relatively recently, historians have figured out who she actually is. And they found out that she's married to a Florentine merchant, Francesco del Giacondo. I've actually never heard it Florentine. I've always heard it Florentine. Like Florentine style, the Italian sword style where you have a longer blade and a shorter blade in tandem with each other to do a wield. I've, I've actually just never heard it Florentine, but I could have been saying it wrong this whole time. This wouldn't be the first time. So that makes her Lisa del Gioconda, and that explains the alternative title of the work, La Gioconda. Huh. Now the reason that she has her arms crossed and is a little bit chubby it's because she's pregnant. In huh. fact, you can kind of see that she's wearing a veil. And that particular type of veil 
was worn by pregnant women at the time. Her husband commissioned the painting when da Vinci was already well known. So it would have been very well, expensive. <laughs> and that makes it very funny for a couple of reasons. One, it was never handed over to the family. Huh. Instead, Leo left it in his will to his apprentice. And two, because for a couple of hundred years, the prevailing theory was that she was not an aristocratic wife, but instead a prostitute. I mean, this is just, of, that would be of the era, yeah. That I would track for the period. Her hair being down and her almost absent eyebrows were common traits of working girls at the time. <laughs> anyway, why is this painting so famous? Well, Da Vinci was already pretty famous, and the painting got stolen. This became a very big news story, and her face suddenly started getting plastered on a whole bunch of newspapers and wanted yeah. posters, making her very recognizable. Yeah. From there, she became the most famous painting, which is why she always looks so smug. Starry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this wasn't the first time it was stolen either, wasn't it? Night. Vincent van Gogh. Yeah, I... Wait. Was that really 1889? God, my sense of time is just absolutely destroyed. No. Yeah, I sure hope it does. Painted while he was- I thought it would surely be late 1700s. In the St. Paul de Musol Asylum. That's here. And this was the view from his bedroom window. Uh-huh. Here is the real view a few decades later. Huh. He chose not to paint the metal bars. <laughs> now, you can see that there are 11 stars in the sky here. Uh -huh. Supposedly, that's reference to Joseph from the Bible. Joseph, he had a hard life. The minivan, he had a hard life too. And he hoped that he would be remembered at least once he was gone. Like Joseph. <laughs> and you know what? Here, it's a really good movie. It worked out for him because everybody remembers Van Gogh and nobody remembers the guys who bullied him and called him a ginger. Yeah. Also, there's kind of a theory that he was killed by some kid. Go check out Wendigoon's channel for more information on that one. God, I love Wendigoon. Wendigoon is just an absolutely amazing creator. Ah, the birth of Venus. All right, let me tell you what's happening in this one. So there's this lady. Venus. Yeah. She is the goddess of beauty, and she is coming up out of the ocean in a big clam, right? Now the clam- Just, just normal things, don't worry. Clam is not a metaphor for her vagina. <laughs> it's that she is the perfect <laughs> pearl. Get it? Now, these two here are a divine wind. They are blowing her like a hot spoonful of soup towards the shore. Uh -huh. And she is carried all the way over to the beach. And this beach, by the way, is a real place called Paphos. It's in Cyprus. Here is what it looks like in real life. Uh huh. Now, when she arrives on the beach, a nymph shows up, which <laughs> is this lady here, and she has a cloak, and she throws the cloak over Venus, and she says, you know what, you're very special. One day they're gonna name a four-blade razor after you. <laughs> Low hanging fruit, but you know what? <laughs> I welcome it. Arrangement in black and grey number one. Also known as... Wait, what was this? Arrangement... Uh, 1871. A lot of these are a lot later than I thought they would be, actually. Wow, the 1910s took the world by storm. Arrangement in black and grey number one. Also known as Whistler's Mother. Most famous for its appearance in the Mr. Bean movie. <laughs> now, when Whistler's Mother originally agreed to be painted, yeah. she agreed to be painted standing up. But she oh. had to pose for so long that eventually she got quite tired and had to sit down. Yeah. There you go. And that became the famous pose. Uh -huh. The Garden of Earthly Delights. All right. What era was this? <laughs> His mouth. This one tracks, though. This one tracks. I could see that absolutely being 1500s. All right. This one is probably my favorite because it looks like a Where's Waldo. <laughs> and then the whole thing just goes completely off the rails. Yeah. So, Mr. Hieronymus. That's a name that's going to make a comeback. Is do I, just, I literally just thought about Hieronymus Lex from Oblivion. <laughs> doing all of this cool, surreal stuff about 500 years ago. So let's start on the left. Here is Adam Garden of Eden symbol. Ah, Garden of Eden symbolism. There we go. And Eve. Words. And the pre-incarnation of Jesus. And they are all hanging out in the Garden of Eden. Now, what's going on in the middle bit? That's 
harder to explain. The best theory is either that this is Eden if people were allowed back into the garden, or if they had never left in the first place, or if man had not committed original sin. But look at the size of that strawberry. <laughs> oh, here he is. <laughs> then on the right-hand panel is hell, or at oh. least a very bad time. This is where Oddlaw would end up, that son of a bitch. <laughs> right, now, the lore, here's it the deepens. interesting bit. It's not painted on a typical canvas. Okay. It's actually a sort of cabinet thing with three panels. Called yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, because that it, it, it tells the story throughout its three panels. A triptych. And the neat thing is, if you close the doors, more painting. Huh. That is the earth, and that is the firmament. That actually kind of reminds me of when you see artwork of Tolkien's Arda, how it's the world and, you know, the space around it, which, which outside of that's the void. It actually reminds me of Arda. I wonder if that played a part into the design of Arda in Tolkien's writing. Firmament. A perfect Probably balance did. between flat earth and globe theory. A Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grand Jet. This thing is pretty big. Wasn't this in uh, 100, Dal or, well, yeah, 100 Dalmatians, right? Disney, right? Pretty sure this was in it. And here's the real life place it was painted after. Although they've beautified it even more with the office building at the back. <laughs> what you may not know is that it is actually a sequel. First, huh. George Surratt painted the left bank, and that's where all the working class sit. Right. You see these guys that, you know, have a bit less money and stuff. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> and then. As, as the kids would say, actually cringe. <laughs> This is the one that you all know, and that is on the right-hand back. Yeah. And all these people are a very bougie sort. That is Scrappy-Doo. And that, <laughs> that's a monkey. It's just a monkey. I do like the left and the right, though. It shows the duality between the poverty and or working class and the upper class and, our, and aristocrats, right? Like, when you look at both of them in tandem with each other, it's actually kind of a cool commentary. The Last Supper. Okay. Yeah, this makes sense. So the scene is this. All the disciples are gathered around, and this is the exact moment that Jesus declares, Hey, by the way, I know one of you betrayed me. <laughs> and this is everyone's shocked reaction to the news. Yeah. Except there's one guy who's just pretending to be shocked. There is one imposter among us. <laughs> and here is who everyone is. I thought this was Mary, by the way. Turns out that's John. Very progressive. God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, look, John's gonna live his best life. And that's all of the paintings, and no one has attempted one since. Uh huh. Please tell me we're getting to modern art. Please tell me. And a yes. wake up. Quickly, flip the Nord logo, Mariana Stretch. Flip it the <laughs> other way, three pyramids. He's solving the mysteries. There's not much time. I've got to log into NordVPN so the corporations can't track me. Marketing companies gang stalking me, listening to me through the walls. We found the death note. Come on. Wake up again. I don't have much time. The feds are at my door. Open up. I refuse to take my Nord milk pills. I wake up again. <laughs> the demon in the corner of my room wants to access my NordVPN. I let him, because I can use it on up to six different devices. <laughs> Thanks, Nordman. <laughs> I know the corporations are building profiles on me. I go to Facebook. I go to Wikipedia. Then suddenly, yeah. I'm getting yeah, yeah, I could see a wiki feed exist. Ads for feet on my Facebook. Big feet, big foot, big farmer. <laughs> on Tuesday, I saw a red car. Coincidence? Huge deal on a two-year plan, plus four bonus months. Four sides to a triangle. Coincidence? What? There's a guy reacting. I think you're talking about faces at that point. Acting to my life in the corner right now. 30 day money back guarantee? What's the goddamn catch? Time's going faster than usual, and only a limited time to get a great deal on a two year plan. I wake up again. It's the perfect Christmas present. Who are you? Wait a minute. My family died in a suspicious house <laughs> fire. Skinwalker in my house. Change location to Finland. Different regions have different prices on plane tickets and hotels. That ain't even a conspiracy. I take more microplastics so I can see through the ether. We're coming in. So it's not about microplastics anymore. It's about macroplastics. Just, just eat the whole brick of like Legos. No one bad. Pizza time. But they're too late. I click <laughs> Hyperborea and I am untouchable. If you understood anything that happened in this ad, go to nordvpn.com slash incognito to get a huge deal on a two-year plan plus four bonus months. Ad 
this is how ad reads should be. Like, I, I had a, I had comments uh, point out how good these ad reads are and that they're just part of the video. And yeah, no, it's like, these are how ad reads should be. They should add to the work. It shouldn't be like, you know, we're talking about art today. And now for today's sponsor, NordVPN, you should do that. Right? Obviously, you, you know, want to segue into the ad read pretty naturally, right? But to add to the piece, you have creators like Mr. Ballin as well that will just make it this absolute experience. And I feel that actually might have... I'd love to see, I'd have to see data on it, right? But might have a stronger correlation to retention of the product and ad, with the ad read like that. But that's how ad reads should be, especially with the prevalence of ad reads on YouTube, right? Just in modernity, right? How people get paid. You, if you, I've seen some bad ad reads. I've seen stuff like this and Mr. Bond, which are good ad reads. This is kind of where you want to be, in my opinion. And over. All right, so this one is about how to spot a fake painting. Oh. I quite like this section, but it kind of got bogged down by all of its technical information, yeah. and it went quite long. So, here it is. For the discerning audience, how to spot a fake painting. This is going to be a deep section, isn't it? Like, there's so much that can go into this. I'm assuming that there's some kind of art forensics or painting forensics that exists. I don't know what the exact name of the position, right? But there are people that specialize in this. <laughs> glug, glug, glug. <laughs> oh my god. Is that a real Michelangelo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He could say that. We're here now. Quick hypothetical lower tax brackets. If paintings like this one or this one, go for literally gajillions of dollars, yeah. that's USD, then what's to stop someone from doing this? Then this. Nothing really. I mean, I'm sure you could find any of these paintings on Google, and I'm sure that you could just, I mean, you can print them off on paper fairly easily. I'm sure there's uh, actual printers that could translate it to canvas fairly easily. And then this. Reproduction exists. Then this. And then saying it's real when it ain't. That would be deceptive marketing. Like if if I was gonna buy something like this, right, or I was gonna buy any form of art, right, and I ask like, "Hey, is, is this authentic?" And I've had to do this multiple times with you know nerdy things that I buy, right? Like I'll buy a uh, Pokemon Black two or White two copy, right, from what, what my local store, right? Or when I buy something on eBay, like a uh, Pokemon, I think it was a it was Fire Red on eBay, and it's like I asked like, "Look, is this authentic?" And it turns out not to be authentic. That is deceptive marketing, and that does have a form of escalation that can occur with that so you can yes make repros but even then that's a little bit of a gray area because I'm, I'm sure there's licenses involved with that potentially unless it's under free use but then even then that might get a little weird because there's definitely free use like music on youtube that gets caught up in certain organizations and certain entities because they own the copyright and it technically is copyright free, but it's not copyright free because that organization owns the music and that, and that organization will consistently consistently send you copyright claims <laughs> and they try to get a license and they don't answer you and it's like i don't know what you want from me <laughs> got a little personal but yeah no reproductions exist and not just art but in other capacities as well I've seen reproduction pokemon uh pearl games reproduction pokemon uh, gba games you know it's just it, it they exist and that's where you just have to like just know what you're looking for, right? Like if you have an authentic like Pokemon, I think it's Diamond Pearl and Platinum. I think even Heart Gold Soul Silver as well. You can actually shine like your phone cam, like turn your phone flashlight on, and then shine it under it, and the cartridge will like glow kind of a reddish because of the infrared. That's where you start getting into specializations. Like he's gonna, I'm sure he's gonna talk about. You know, faking a painting. Yeah. Turns out forging, I think, not is what's called. Not much at all. In fact, it can be very difficult to tell these fake ass paintings from the ones that keep it real. Right. There's a whole ass art to detecting these fakes. Yeah. And it's become an arms race where the authenticators find new ways of detecting and the fakers find new ways to get around their methods. I mean, we see this the same thing in anti cheat, right? You have game, multiplayer game, and. Cheaters will do something, create certain protocols to be able to like aimbot and stuff. And then the devs will be like, well, we don't want that. And then they'll create their anti-cheat or buff their anti-cheat, which will in response cause the uh, the people supplying these cheats and hacks that'll cause them to get better. And it, it, it is an arms race. It's a very similar arms race concept. Technology is advanced. Do you think that makes it harder to make good forgeries? No, you can beat the forensics. So, authentication. There are three main categories. Provenance, 
right. connoisseurship, forensics. Okay. Let's start in alphabetical order. I'm familiar. Provenance. Now, provenance follows the what? history of the painting, tracking down the previous sellers and the buyers, all the galleries that exhibited it, uh -huh. the hand-to-hand -hand that it was passed through, all the way back to the original painter. Yeah. However, the older the work, the harder it is, generally, to track the provenance. Yeah. Take, for example, the most expensive painting ever sold, the Salvatore Mundi, the final da Vinci. Uh -huh. Sold in 2017. I could actually see why that would go for a lot of money. The final Da Vinci. I could actually see why there would be a lot of money on that. For $400 million. Jesus. And it can own do you know what I could do with $400 million? Definitely not buy a painting. Like, that would get me and a lot of people out of debt and, like, then some. Like, we're talking, like, the start of generational wealth. I could not imagine doing this. Like, I mean, I don't know. I feel guilty if I, I would feel guilty if I bought like a Pokemon black two or white two copy for like anywhere over like $300. I would feel incredibly guilty for that. Cause like, that's a lot of money, $400 million. You, and that's back. That's what? 2017 money. That's more today because it's in the last six, seven years about we've experienced a lot of inflation, you know, just, just more money and money that makes money goes less far <laughs> but like god that's nutty that's that's 2017 money not as much as like 2008 money or like 1900s money that's still a lot more money today only be traced back to 1958 back then it was sold for 45 pounds nice but in the other 500 years of its history no one knew where this thing was so if that's a forgery right if that's a forgery that man's gotta have the access to some good lawyers, right? Yeah, he's got to have access to some sort of legal team that if this was found out to be a forgery, the seller could potentially be held liable. I would assume at the very least some sort of buyer protection would exist, right? Even today, people still dispute whether it's genuine. I think it's a real flim flam. And this is a made up piece of junk. Nice. I think it's fake art news. <laughs> real? in drag then it turns up in america in new orleans it's happening oh i see what's happening i think we've wished this da vinci into existence here's the lost leonardo that somebody once mentioned in a book provenance has gotten a lot easier over time right you used to have to track down books and read catalogs and stuff but yeah. now it's all online yeah. control plus f there it is. <laughs> so you see, kid, there's nothing online. Nothing. Tell me who you bought this from, you son of a bitch. Where did you get this? <laughs> Tell me the name of the auction house that sold you it. Connoisseurship. Look at the work. Yeah. Do you believe what you are seeing? How does it look? How does it taste? Are these ballpoint pen strokes those of a master artist? Maybe. Luckily, there are people like Martin Kemp, who spend their whole careers focusing on single artists. Okay. I've been dealing with Leonardo for, I suppose, about 50 years. They can pick out the fakes. So, for example, when he was looking at La Bella Principessa, he went, yep, he uses the Trois Crayon. He's a left-handed artist. The proportions uh -huh. of the head and the face are all correct. You know what? I'm going to give this a big rubber stamp right there in the middle of the painting confirmed well so that's the thing is that someone that can without a shadow of a doubt authenticate that someone that is that specialized and that knowledgeable on that subject you know that they're getting paid good money right like they got to be getting paid good money because that confirmation of whether it's fake or genuine alone is the difference between you know hundreds of millions of dollars potentially like he is probably in high demand when you know the art market has to deal with his specific uh, his specific field of study, his specific artist. So for the fakers, they have to have a keen understanding of who they are copying. One of the best fakers, Almir Dehore, for example, mastered the brushstrokes of artists such as Matisse, Mogdiliani, and Renoir so well uh -huh. that hundreds of museums are currently in possession of his works without uh -huh even knowing it. Wild. Yes, well, Michelangelo was famous for his congiante painting techniques, and I can't see any of that here. You're zero for two, kid. You're going down. <laughs> Forensics. This thing's going straight to the lab. You're about to have a paint 
brush up with yeah. the law. Awful. Awful. Masterpiece. More like you're a real yeah. masterpiece. <laughs> oh my god! Please. <laughs> All right, now the people that solve murders have really changed the game when it comes to art forgeries. But As somebody that uh, has a family member that's in forensics, it's actually wild what they do. Implementing radiocarbon dating. Ah, radiocarbon yes. dating. Carbon dating, yeah, but it's not serious. Listen, you're made out of carbon, I'm made out of carbon. Yeah. Paintings are made out of carbon. And when a thing is made out of carbon, there are these unusual isotopes of carbon-14, right? Okay. They're floating all throughout the air and the atmosphere. Now, all living things contain a trace of them. Yeah. They are taken in when something eats, breathes, anything else. And okay. that happens continuously throughout the life cycle. However, when the organism dies, Burger. it stops taking in new carbon, right? Which yeah. means it stops taking in new carbon-14. Okay. Same thing happens to a painting. You've stopped putting paint on the thing, no more carbon. Right. Carbon-14 is an unstable isotope, and it decays at a very... It, it'll decay, so I think I'm assuming we're getting a half-life. ...very steady rate. <laughs> Poof. It turns into nitrogen-14 and a beta particle. Oh. Beta! <laughs> and because these carbon-14 atoms decay at a very steady rate, in principle, you can look at the proportional number of carbon-14 atoms and determine how old something is. More yeah. carbon-14? Newer painting, less carbon-14, older painting. Right, there would theoretically be an upper limit of that, but looking at the time in years being 22,000 years, we're nowhere near that, it seems. Like, there's, there's got to be an upper limit for something to have been deceased that long ago. Which, I mean, I'd have to look into it, right? I'd have to look into if we radiocarbon date fossils. I thought we did, but I'd have to see what the upper limit is. In 1985, using this technique, they caught a guy, Robert Trotter, who forged a Sarah Hon paper. Ah, far too many carbon-14 atoms. Lock him up, boys. Yeah. But there are even simpler methods of testing the age of a pigment. Three Jackson Pollock paintings were found to be fake when it was determined that the pigments on the canvas weren't sold until the 1960s. That's a, that's a really easy one, to be fair. Like, haven't there been restoration channels that have been, like, called out for certain things like that? Like, this can't be 100 years old. We, like, literally made this, like, this specific product, like, last year. Or, like, this didn't exist until the 1980s when you're saying it's from the early 1900s, late 1800s, right? Like, it's one of those that just, you get to, like, cite your sources and look at them and be like, yeah, this is actually impossible. We gotcha. And that, that gotcha moment is great. But... Pollock was dead by 1956. Yeah. Nowadays, there are huge pigment libraries that can be easily cross-referenced. So that shows the year a pigment was first introduced yeah. and what year it stopped being used. Huh. For example, anything that has titanium white has to have been produced in the last 80 years. Right. I'm going to be honest with you, kid. Michelangelo never used the yellow Crayola. X-rays. <laughs> now. So we went over... In the, the, the I Am Become Fancy video regarding the dresses in France, the green ones being ars having arsenic in them for the uh, the coloring, right? I wonder if there, there's got to be arsenic-based paints. Or I, there's probably even lead-based paints, actually. So those would be potential reasons just due to the, the toxicity of them, right? The toxicity of the, uh, I mean, le uh, lead's case, right? Element, but, you know, uh, compounds, mixtures, what, what have you, et cetera. Anything that's toxic, right? That would be a valid reason to stop using said said paint or, or said medium. You can blast this thing with some radiation and look behind the painting to see what's underneath. Huh. For example, did the artist do a sketch first? Maybe this is painted over something else. Right. If you look behind the Mona Lisa, you can actually see that she had a much larger head once. Although maybe it just shrunk with age. And you can see that veil much more easily. Yeah. Also, if you x-ray even further, you <laughs> can see her fully formed skeleton. That's not how that works. But the art forgers of today are a wily bunch. Forgers can source old canvases from the correct period. They huh. can use error-matching pigments. Even the carbon date. That's going the extra step, though, actually. Yeah. That's actually going the extra step. Like, that is a... 
serious attempt at forging a piece of art. Wow. It can be a bit unreliable. Heck, even the x-rays can be bullshitted. Yeah. As forgers take into account that their work will be x-rayed, as they do a sort of fake painting or sketch first, and then paint the next version on top. Yeah. All right, kid. I'll give you $20,000 for this, or a shiny new bottle of Ritalin. No! <laughs> uh, works every time. Not the riddle. It reminds me of the memes of just like <laughs> when you're exhausted and you rail a riddle in and then you beat the entirety of Halo 3 Legendary at 4 a.m. on a Guitar Hero controller without dying. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, this video goes hard. I love this it. This section is about Shakespeare. Wow, that would make so much sense for it to be in the theater video on the main channel. It would be. This now we're dude here. showed up and changed the game. Yeah, he Shakespeare. Did. Here's the thing, though. It's not that he was like perfect or anything. It's that he he was game changing. And from my understanding, he appealed to the masses rather than the elite and aristocratic, from my understanding. And man, he he is. There are so many D jokes in his works. Like, it's actually insane. Like, you, like I had people in high school like, oh, my God, I don't want to read Shakespeare. It's so boring. And I looked into it. I'm like, oh, my God, this is, this, this, this is filthy. Like, this is actually filthy. We basically know nothing about him. First, we don't know what he looked like. Nice. There are two best guesses. One is from this engraving on a first folio. But that wasn't put together until seven years after he was already dead. <laughs> One of his peers, Ben Johnson, knew him, though, and said, Yeah, it's pretty close. So maybe. The second is a bust that was made for his grave. Huh. There are a bunch of others, but they weren't commissioned by Shakespeare himself. No. They weren't done while he was alive, and he didn't exactly stop to pose for them. No. But these are the ones we most recognize him by. It's actually kind of wild. This includes Chandos which is probably the most recognizable. Uh -huh. So this could be him, or this could be some completely other dude, <laughs> or it could be an idealized version. Now, yeah. we also don't know exactly when he was born, or when he died, or how he died. His birthday is celebrated on the 23rd of April, but there's no record of that. And then he died on the 23rd of April as well. So he died mm. on his birthday? Odd coincidence. I mean... For an artist, I mean, some of these, some of these artists, uh, they're they're next level. So I mean, that I, I I could see reasons. But we know that he did marry a lady named Anne Hathaway. What? Yes, same as Catwoman. <laughs> but this one was the original. We nice. also don't even really know how to spell his name. There are tons of different signatures by him. Ah, uh, oh, that chalk on the chalkboard. Ugh, I'm glad I was glad I had whiteboards. Ugh. But they're practically all spelt differently. Yeah. And let's not even get started on the conspiracies of whether or not he really wrote his plays. <laughs> the son of two illiterate parents from a lower class neighborhood suddenly becoming the world's greatest playwright. Hmm. That's actually I that's believable, actually. Parents providing the best uh, childhood and best experience for their child so that way the child doesn't have to grow up with the same pains and stressors that they did like that's that's you know believable to me actually bit suspicious also whether he was gay or nice. worse whether he was foreign or Ooh. what the hell is going on with his gra my god you have to understand like we've come a long way since like this the 15 1600s Brave. So if you go to the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, there is his grave. There he lays, but there is an engraving above him. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he who moves my bones. Cursed, you see. You're not allowed to dig him up. Yeah. So everyone is super spooked out by the curse, and they refuse to dig him up. So archaeologists instead have done radar scans. Uh-huh. Turns out... His head is missing. Nice. He was grave robbed in 1794. So we can't even reconstruct him that way. And <laughs> they won't open it up for DNA tests. So well, yeah, I mean, boiling a, a tomb that a grave at the very least. Yeah, that's a little bit of a taboo. And it, really just a lot of places. I, I could see that. The fact that his head is just like... I feel like somebody's going to be like, ah, yes, I, I, my family has held his skull for many a century at this point. So just like, just, <laughs> just old dick wizard comes up. Yes, would you like to take a look at the skull? He is the mystical, magical skull of Shakespeare. <laughs> God.
So it's likely that we will never know the truth. No. The government is hiding something. My God. The point is, Shakespeare stole a theatre at one point. Okay, quick Shakespeare moment. Yeah. In 1599, Shakespeare was working as a playwright with his acting troupe called The Lord Chamberlain's Men. Yeah. Now, they were leasing out a theatre in Shoreditch called The Theatre. Oh, my Creative God. name. Anyway, Very creative. they had a disagreement with the landlord, Giles Allen. Giles revoked their lease. Uh -huh. Shakespeare and the Chamberlain's men were not very happy about that, but no. they had no option but to walk away. Yeah. But a few days later, in the dead of night, they came they put back. on the play. Now, the group met up just outside the theatre, and they had bribed the watchman to look the other way. Then, with Dax... <laughs> straight up... They straight up oblivion, like... like <laughs> the, the stupid game where you bribe someone or you use... The, disp the disposition mini game, straight up that. Those and tools in hand, they broke into the theater. Now they weren't there to kill Giles, no. and they weren't there to steal stuff from the theater. No, they were there to rob the theater. Huh. They tore down the entire building piece by piece, and they started carting it away to a warehouse. From the that's on like what? What's the subreddit r slash like nuclear revenge? Just taking down the whole theater. <laughs> yeah, they ferried it across the Thames and over to Southwark. With the materials that they stole, they constructed the Globe Theater. Wow. And there it stood for the next 14 years <laughs> until it <laughs> burned down. It was a performance of Henry VIII and a prop cannon was involved. Aww. Don't worry about that. But then one, look, one thing led to the other. It was rebuilt. But then in 1642, it was shut down again. Oh. But in 1997, a recreation of the Globe Theatre was made once more. And in London, you can visit it today. As long as you can avoid being stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the knife bins. And now for the best section of all. Come on, people, we're ready to shoot. Where's the pizza box with the hole in it? Oh, no, my absolute legend. That's my cue. I gotta go. It's always Pack the pizza soon. box. Don't always forget the pizza box. <laughs> I absolutely love this. I am here if this is gonna be the next few videos. Like, I am here for this. Like, I have enough, like, weird, nerdy, like, interests in, like, history and how things work that this is definitely gonna, like, this is definitely right up my alley. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on Shakespeare, on art? Do you have any uh, things that you know about art and uh, how people forge art from, you know, just like, you know, uh, shows that have aired and stuff like that? Let me know in the comments section and uh, see you in the next one.